founders of Ethereum itself. Uh, we usually have Joe here as the founder. We have uh, another founder here tonight. Uh, I don't know Joe He's in Copenhagen. He's in Copenhagen. <laughs> they switched uh, places. One is in Europe and one's here. Um, Gavin wrote uh, the original protocol for Ethereum with Vitalik. He wrote the co wrote the Ethereum virtual machine. I'm going to go on and on with it. He wrote the Ethereum virtual machine, the Solidity uh, smart contract programming language, uh, and also a founder of Ethicor now. So I'm very happy to have them both, and I'll let uh, Dr. Stein. Uh, yeah, thanks for to uh, speak here in New York. So uh, this is uh, TJ, he's also part of ESCO. Um, so just that you know. Hello. Hi everyone, <laughs> TJ. <laughs> um, just maybe a quick show of hands, like who, who's familiar with Ethereum? Like, okay, so, so uh, who, who doesn't know at all what Ethereum is? Like, okay, so maybe Gav can do three, three, three sentence introduction. Cool. Um, so uh, yeah, I want to speak a little bit about what um, what we're doing here at Ethcore. Um, so we started Ethcore. Um, it's a company uh, set up in London last year. Um, so what do you want to do? So cool stuff. So you can do cool stuff. So these are projects where um, that are using um, the the client we are we are currently building. Um, so the idea basically is we want to. Um, we are working on a um, um, on a new implementation, uh, like a really lightweight and fast client uh, that's very suitable for IoT and other um, and other high performance uh, applications. So uh, when you go to our website, you can see a little bit of an overview of what our um, current timeline is. So we've started in December with a clean room implementation um, in, in Rust um, that we deployed um, and launched a couple of weeks ago, last, when was it, like two weeks, two weeks ago? Two weeks, um, 1.0. Yeah, so it's called Parity on par with the other implementations, the Go and C++ implementation, so um, ready for Homestead. Um, and we just also mined our first block on the Ethereum mainnet. Uh, for the next year, um, we have plans to uh, work on um, work on improvements of the, uh, of the implementation, so working on the modularity of the entire protocol, working on, um, on scalability as well as privacy. So uh, just a quick um, deep dive into what, um, into what I mean. Um, Gavin will also speak a little bit about um, some things. So uh, the modularity basically um, will allow to, to where is where we, um, where we lift um, or where we abstract um, the, the protocol, so the different components Proof of work, uh, the way how the um, how the uh, state is updated, the way how transactions are processed. So um, so it, be it becomes more um, more modular for for upgrades such as the upgrade from proof of work to proof of stake at a certain point. Um, scalability, um, you all know probably that uh, that there are issues around the scalability of the blockchain. So we're working here on. Um, parallelizing the processing of the transactions in the virtual machine, first node-wise, so on a local level, and then long-term on, the, um, on the global level, parallelizing the, the independent transactions or the processing of the independent transactions in the global network. And then um, thirdly, confidentiality. The, we have different plans, stepwise approach to kind of full privacy on the blockchain. So first of all, um, kind of semi-trusted uh, semi -trusted entities that will allow you to transact in a semi-private semi manner. And then uh, long-term, there are plans um, with, um, such as uh, ZK SNARKs to include zero-knowledge proofs. Um, so yeah, if you <coughs> want to know more what we are, what we are doing, um, go to our website. You can download the Parity Client. Um, and also, we are hiring in case we are interested in joining our team. So I'll hand over to Carol. <coughs>
who has like no idea what Ethereum is? <laughs> That's good. Good start. Um, Um, yeah, so <laughs> for understanding what Ethereum is, you don't really need to know any of this stuff. So like, you know, hashing and ASICs and stuff which really doesn't actually matter that much. It's, it's, that's kind of an implementation level detail. So to really understand what, um, it still doesn't work. Allows the top on the screen. Um, it's actually just a computer. That's an old one, but it's probably about as fast. Um, it's really slow, it's really expensive. Um, and it's got this odd thing where sometimes it, it, it sort of rewinds time and then decides to do something else. Um, we call that like a, a chain reorganization. And it's the whole, uh, this 51% attack is, is basically to do with all of that. I think maybe the batteries. <laughs> or is it, is it that? Okay. Oh, I'm too far. Okay. <laughs> um, so it doesn't sound very good, no. <laughs> um, but actually it's got a bunch of attributes that make it really, really useful. Um, and it's because of these attributes that you know, we see all of you guys here tonight. Um, <coughs> until now, we've rarely had systems Never really had systems that have that have been um, corrupt, corruptible proof um, that have been um, this degree of verifier had this degree of verifiability in order to be able to. And the notion of there being a shared singleton um, in the world is is kind of odd notion to think about. Normally, when there's a singleton, there's actually a single physical object. So when I log into a uh, you know a, a server through SSH, there's usually a machine at the other end of the connection. Um, with blockchain, there isn't that real notion. It's actually a, it's a purely virtual machine. It's a virtual construct. It's an abstract construct. It doesn't really exist. It exists as um, as the the emergent effect of many computers all talking with each other. So um, we can compare it to Bitcoin. And Bitcoin would be this kind of old school adding machine, and uh, Ethereum in, in comparison would be like a, a shiny computer. That you can um, and it's it's got these um, cool attributes for when you want to program it. So it's like natively multi-user, so you automatically get as many accounts as you need. Um, that's like kind of built into the processor. Um, and it's natively object-oriented, which is really nice because you can be absolutely guaranteed that you've got encapsulation, so your objects can't interfere with each other without your say-so. Um, and for that matter, with anyone else's. Um, and it's it's very accessible. Um, and so if uh, you know, in this sense, smart contracts are actually these, these programs that run on this, this blockchain computer. Um, so Bitcoin, in that sense, would actually be a, a sort of spreadsheet kind of smart program. Uh, but the great thing about Ethereum is that you can have any of these smart programs. So you can program to do whatever you want. Um, and, you know, we've got these nice um, additional attributes for, for when we want to program it, so we don't have to worry about like, atomic transactions. They're all atomic transactions. We don't have to worry about, like, checkpointing or anything like that. It's all fine. Um, and this thing, like, all of the messages, all of the things that, like, poke these objects in the machine to make them do different things, like change the ownership of an asset or, or move funds from one place to another, um, you can always tell who's actually trying to, um, try to do that action. And you can refuse to do the action depending on uh, where it's coming from. So, for example, you might say, right, well, um, I will only move accounts from account A if it's the person A that tells me to do so. Or I will only move accounts from my account if it's my identity or my lawyer's identity that tells me to do so. And you know, you can build very complicated multi-sigs like this that are very sophisticated and, and have uh, very, very particular security attributes. Um, and yeah, we've got these, these other uh, really interesting uh, properties as well, like immortality. 
you know, normally with like immortality, immortality of a computer system, that, that kind of doesn't make sense. You turn a computer off, everything in memory is gone, right? Uh, you wipe the hard disk and you can't get it back again. Um, but actually in Ethereum, uh, <laughs> stuff is kind of immortal, right? It, it doesn't really go away. There's no way to make it stop. There's like, if you don't program an off button into, into one of these autonomous objects, then it's just going to keep going. You can't, you can't sort of stop it, at least not without like persuading everybody who's maintaining the network to, to actually alter their code in a particular way to make it go away. And that's, that's one of these things that leads to this kind of incorruptibility or the inability to take, take things down or stop particular um, actions from happening. Um, so it's like, yeah, what, what's going on? Well, actually, way back when, uh, I actually remember when this cartoon came out the first time, um, it was all about you know, SQL databases. And inevitably, um, the decision makers didn't really know what an SQL database was, they just knew they wanted one. And we're kind of seeing the same thing today. So the blockchain is there. Um, and then there's, there's important things to understand with permission versus permissionless. Uh, does everyone here know the difference? You know, when, when we talk about these terms, yeah? Have hands up if you know the difference. So basically it's like uh, the difference between the, the, the public blockchain, so the thing that everyone can have access to and everyone can use, and sort of private chains that are just used between consortiums of people or within a particular organization. And there are different ways of like forming the consensus of what's happened. Um, these are generally referred to as like proof of work, which is where you burn an awful lot of real world energy, um, like equivalent to a small country's um, uh, deficit in, in terms of uh, in terms of the wastage. Uh, it's really bad. Um, versus like proof of stake, where you actually you're only wasting virtual assets, so you don't you essentially waste um, um, what are often known as like coin days, basically. Um, days of keeping a particular virtual asset in one place. Um, and then proof of authority, which is sort of a simplification of proof of stake, where you don't actually have to waste anything, but authority is given to you as being one of the gatekeepers or guardians of, a, of this particular network. Um, I'm not going to go into this. So I'm going to move on to the next. Who wants to hear about like really technical stuff about what we're doing? Yeah. Oh, awesome! Okay, well, I will not skip on this. Um, right. So, uh, where are we in the project? So we've we've done um, the Olympic thing that was like way back early last year. That's where we uh, we engaged the community to try and break it before we did the first release, um, and that went fine. So then we went on to uh, release the Frontier Network, uh, which we did. I think it was July. Last year, um, and that went all reasonably well, reasonably smoothly. Um, and so, uh, beginning this year, we did the host networks. So that's another one off the list. So that's uh, that's done now. So the main net is now the hosted network, um, which leaves um, a, a bunch more stuff to do. Um, so the next couple of things are, that are on the on the schedule are the Metropolis uh, release, which coming out later this year. Um, and I'm actually going to go into what the protocol improvements for Metropolis are going to be now. Um, in addition to that, there's also the browser, um, which is which is uh, coming along nicely. You can download the wallet, which is basically the browser, except just the single fixed application in there. Um, and following that, there's going to be Serenity, which is mostly a move to the proof of stake <coughs> algorithm that's got a whole load of other stuff to do with the protocol that's going to be folded in. Um, and it will probably include some uh, basic scalability stuff as well. And then beyond where uh, all this stuff that we can do, we'll see where we can do. Um, and for Ethcore, we'll be, um, uh, we've got our own sort of uh, roadmap where we're going to be uh, sort of um, merging with, uh, with the Ethereum roadmap around purity time, where we're going to, this is our, um, our software fork to move to the Serenity protocol. But it's also going to include some enterprise grade stuff. Um, the nice thing about Serenity is that it's planned to remove a lot of the stuff that's 
um, specific to it being a public open network, specific to that being Ether. So it's actually going to move that up to a higher level. That's what Yeta was sort of talking about before. We're going to move some of the stuff that's uh, baked into the protocol. We're actually going to move that up into a contract and just have the contract execute on a much simpler, more abstract protocol. And that's going to come in around the serenity time. And uh, purity will be our, our, um, our code base for, for serenity. Um, for now, while we're in the parity uh, phase of things, um, so the homestead phase of things, um, we've got the uh, civility and attunuity releases. So the civility is coming up next, which is going to introduce a whole load of reliability stuff. Uh, this is basically going to be um, a hypervisor environment for the, uh, for the blockchain core. So basically we're going to sort of tease all the bits of the core apart, the networking stuff and the database, uh, the JSON RPC stuff. Um, from the sort of the serious bit in the middle that actually looks after the consensus and they'll all be different processes so they won't have access to each other's memory space which makes it very difficult for them to, to, to break each other <coughs> and then there'll be a hypervisor which sort of looks after and makes them all make sure they're all getting along <coughs> if any of them die it just sort of restarts them. Um, Tenuity is going to be our light client release which will be coming uh, probably summertime like summer end of summer um, we already have some of the white client attributes in parity, so we have state tree pruning, which basically means that uh, the database doesn't take up two gigabytes, but instead 200 megabytes, which is you know, a substantial saving. Uh, it also makes a lot of stuff go faster. Um, so yeah, Metropolis. Metropolis. So this is going to introduce a bunch of um, really useful protocol changes. Um, and these are them, uh, more or less. So we have some uh, simplification of the virtual machine. So we're going to actually remove some of the instructions from it. Um, up until now, in order to get information about the, uh, about the environment, in particular things like the hashes of blocks that have gone before, you have to actually use the virtual machine, these special instructions that just sort of happen to know about the blockchain. Um, well, these will now be contained in special contracts. And this has um, a useful um, side effect, which I'll move on to. Um, we've also got these, uh, uh, at the moment, storage slots are kind of 32 bytes, so they're all 32 bytes, kind of pretending to be memory. Um, they're, not, they're going to be, uh, well, this restriction removed, so you'll be able to store arbitrary data in there. And uh, interesting, we're going to have uh, transactions that can have null signatures. Um, The addresses for contracts when they're created up until now are dependent on two things. Um, the nonce of, a, of the creation um, account and also the, the, the account itself. That's going to be changed in, uh, in an interesting way. And we're going to remove some of the information from the logs. So in terms of the uh, virtual machine simplification, um, we're going to add three new contracts. The block hash contract, a special address 10, the state root contract, a special address 20, and the, uh, the gas use contract, a special address 30. And what this does is it removes, well, one opcode is removed here. For this one, we can now get the state roots of previous blocks, which is very useful for um, a proof of stake algorithm. Um, and for the last one, it allows us to remove some of the, um, uh, some of the information from, um, from the logs that have been uh, that are stored in this information is stored in logs, it allows us to remove that from the logs. And this is very handy for when we execute transactions. Um, in terms of the dynamic size storage slot, so yeah, until now it's kind of, it's a really kind of annoying to have to have um, a maximum of 32 bytes that you store in each storage slot. What this means is that you can't really store heavily structured data very easily, and when you do, you have to do it in terms of multiple storage slots, which is very, very costly. Um, every access to a storage slot costs a lot of gas, and you're only allowed a certain amount of gas per block. So if you try and store too much data, um, then you end up having too much gas usage, and sometimes you can't even fit your contract into a single block, and then it becomes kind of useless. Um, what this, is, uh, what this change is doing is allowing you to store any amount of data. And then basically the idea is you pull it all out of storage, you do some complicated operations which are actually comparatively cheap because we don't charge much for actually operating the EVM. We mostly charge things for I.O., so storage, uh, saving loading. And then once you're done with that, you can then flush it out <coughs> out of storage and the whole thing doesn't cost too much. 
Um, yeah, so at the moment, all transactions are signed. So they come from a particular address. If the signature is invalid, then the transaction is thrown out. Um, it never even gets into the channel. This is, this is great, but to take it in sort of OpenGL terms, this is kind of like a fixed function pipeline. You're actually fixing a lot of the stuff that you might want to later make programmatic. Um, what this alteration does is it starts making some of this stuff uh, able to be programmatic. So what we can now have is transactions that don't actually have a signature. So it's like they don't come from anyone, right? They're just sort of posited as, uh, as interesting bits of data that might possibly be useful on a blockchain. Um, so why would a miner ever bother including the bit of data? I mean, you know, it's, it's only going to cost the miner. Because it, at, at worst, it's an opportunity cost. At best, it's an opportunity cost. At worst, um, they're actually expending their own, their own cycles and, uh, uh, by evaluating it. Well, it allows us to do a bunch of interesting stuff. So we get two key features. Firstly, authenticate by contract. What this means is that you can have your own code deposited in, in Ethereum that actually works out who the contract, who the transaction is from without using Ethereum's hard-coded um, cryptographic primitives um, of the signature that, that's actually normally included in the transaction. So it can, for instance, check the data. Maybe the data contains a hash, or, well, contains a pre-hash image that hashes to something that the contract knows about, in which case the contract can kind of say, yes, I vouch for this transaction. I know it's not signed by anyone, but I, I know this and I think it's good. So I'll, um, and then we move on to the next bit, pay for this transaction to be executed. So this is where contracts can now, given some data from the outside world that's unsigned, it has no particular provenance, can now say, actually, this is useful data. I will, I will give my own ether to have this contract, to have this transaction executed. And those of you that are sort of forward and forward thinkers will realize this can enable a bunch of stuff that, that we've needed for quite a long time. Some things like timers, right? So now you can have an alarm service, yeah? Because the alarm service, you can set up a contract that pays someone to deposit a transaction that calls another contract that ends up giving the first contract money. And the nice thing is, until this thing, the alarm service didn't really work because there was no way for another contract to check whether some incoming data was actually valuable or not. So there was no way to vouch for it. Well, now there is. This does need alterations to the miner. And this isn't a protocol alteration. This is actually a miner alteration. So this is where uh, miners actually have to be able to recognize that these transactions, that don't appear to be paying them, paying them, the miner for their, for their time, actually do end up paying the miner for their time. It's just that they need to execute the first few opcodes in order to get to the point where the miner gets paid. So this is going to the first things to do is kind of pattern matching. So you know, just check whether the transaction looks like it's the sort of code that ends up paying the miner. And then the thing to do after that is kind of give it a bit of gas, so give it a bit of computation. Uh, let it run along for the first, whatever, 10 or 20,000 gas and see if the miner does end up being paid. And the cool thing about this is it doesn't have to be paid in ether. So it could be paid in some other currency. Um, it's, as long as the miner sort of doesn't mind um, expending its, its opportunity cost, expending the gas, um, then in principle it could be, um, it, it could be paid in any, uh, any sort of asset. And it could also be that the miner itself has, I don't know, some deal with, uh, with a DAP and the DAP sends unsigned transactions, and the miner notices that these are unsigned transactions from this bill to this particular DAP's contract, and actually executes it on good faith, knowing that maybe the DAP author has, has paid the, the miner, I don't know, for a thousand transactions a month for free. And this kind of, um, these kinds of uh, deals could, in principle, be built into the system. Um, so this is a sort of more subtle um, improvement. So this is where we, um, uh, up until now, the way the system works is when you create a contract, the contract's address is, is actually a cryptographic um, um, identifier. Um, and the, uh, the, this identifier is derived from the creator of the contract. So it could itself be another contract, but um, often is, is actually a sort of outside external account. 
um, and the nonce, which is basically the number of contracts they've created so far. Um, it's gonna, that's actually going to be going to be discarded, and it's now going to be the creator um, plus the code. Uh, this has some interesting uh, implications. Um, the most important is that you can now be certain if you know the creator and you know the address of the contract, uh, the, sorry, the code of the contract, you know what the address is going to be. Furthermore, if you know the creator and you know the address of the contract, and you have maybe a selection of, of uh, codes that it could be, you can choose which one it actually is. And you can do that before it's been deployed to the chain. So you can be sure that when someone gives you an address of a contract to be, ex to be transacting with, that that will have the code in it, even if it's not yet deployed. Or if it has been deployed, but it hasn't yet sort of reached the 12 confirmations that you, that you expect before you know it's not going to be reverted. How do you define code there? Say again? How do you define code there? Uh, the code is the contract's code. So the, you know, the, 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 code, the code that would get executed when the transaction hits it. And it's hashed? Uh, it's hashed along with the creator of the contract. Now, you've got an issue because if the creator creates the same code, or the same contract with the same code multiple times, it's going to end up at the same address. Um, basically, if there's already code there, that's an invalid transaction. And the way to get around it is by adding nonces into the code itself. So if you want to create multiple, um, multiple contracts of the same code, then you would just add an extra bit of, of data at the end, or at the beginning, or whatever, um, almost like a comment uh, that, that increments, so each one's the same. Now, this is probably the most, um, well, I don't know. For me, uh, uh, it's one of the most important changes. So, at the moment, logs are quite informative. So the logs are, um, sorry, actually, I should read the receipts, not logs. Um, the receipts are, are quite informative. The receipt of a transaction basically tells you a bunch of stuff. Firstly, it tells you what logs went on during the transaction's time. Now, logs are essentially the way that um, a contract um, uh, communicates with the external world, including perhaps the DAP that is, that is using the contract, right? So when a contract wants to say, hey, uh, this account received some funds on uh, Wednesday the 24th of June 2014, um, it, uh, it, can, it can write a log on that event. And then the DAP that's actually using this contract can search for that log and see if it was there. And maybe display it in a, in a bunch of transactions. You know, this is what happened in June 2014. Um, the next thing it does, it tells you how much gas has been used so far. So how much gas was used up until the point that this contract was executed. Um, this transaction was executed. And the, the next thing, the, the final thing it does is it tells you the, the med state. And this is the important one. And the med state is the state of the tree, so the state of the entire Ethereum world immediately after the transaction executed. Right? So now what you've got is you have to have a very, very formal definition of what happened, what the world was immediately after this transaction and before the next one. And when you have this, what it means is that you have to execute all transactions in series. You can't execute any at the same time, right? And this has dire effect, dire consequences for parallel. It means that when you've got a multi-core processor and you've got, I don't know, um, 200 transactions, all of which are independent of each other, they're all dealing with different addresses, you can't execute them all at the same time, you have to execute them one after each other because you need this med state, you need this hash of what the world was between these two transactions, one before, one after. <coughs> if we remove that, which we are doing, then in principle, you can execute them all at the same time, as long as they don't interfere with each other. If they interfere with each other, there has to be an ordering, and that's defined in the block. But if they don't interfere with each other, then you just put them on different cores and have them spin. This means that if we place Ethereum on a 24-core enterprise-grade server, we can, at least in principle, in the you know, best possible case, try to actually process 24 times as much transaction.
we won't get anywhere near that because they will tend to interfere with each other. But we could, you know, reasonably estimate a five to ten x improvement on such model, which is nice. Okay, so that's that's all the changes for uh, Metropolis that are planned at least so far. Um, the next part of the talk, you think so many talks, you only have three talks. Um, the next part of the talk is uh, kind of more musings on um, the ecosystem outside of outside of the kernel, so outside of the uh, the core of the theory. Um, so yeah, I mean, we built we built the theory. It's great, you know, it's out there, it's running. There's not all that much on it yet. It's been going for nine months, so it's had a bit of time. So you know, what what's missing? Well, actually, it's like we built the kernel of the operating system, but we haven't really built any file system utilities, and certainly haven't built like you know the graphical windowing environment and all of the cool uh, all the cool app, uh, applications that run. So I want to just give you a feel for for what these applications are going to be and, and how they all fit into each other. Um, and I'm going to start with like what I've called the three pillars, which are like as far as I see it, three critical bits of infrastructure that are going to be needed before we can move on to the really, really cool stuff. Or at least three bits of infrastructure which will help making the cool stuff an awful lot easier. The three bits of infrastructure are really easy. Um, identity, assets, and data. Yeah. So identity is about describing things that aren't fungible. They're about uniqueness and uh, individuals. Assets are about things that are fungible. Um, but are still very, um, very clearly sort of um, ownable. Data is stuff that isn't ownable, and just this sort of kind of general information um, that's at least compared to these two not particularly structured. Uh, it doesn't fit into a sort of um, an ownership um, relation with anything else. And kind of for those who are kind of uh, mathematically oriented, I kind of liken this to the one, the many. So, identity. Identity is, uh, there's a bunch of things that could, that could have identity. So the most obvious one is people, like you and me, right? We, we are definitely individual, we are unique. We like to think of ourselves like that. Um, the next thing is kind of things that are unique. Some things are unique, some things are not very unique. Like mass produced stuff is generally not very unique. You can make it unique, you can make it your own, but in general it, it, it's pretty, uh, it's pretty fungible. But examples of unique things might be you know, a priceless Monet painting, um, or a particular shipping container that's on its way between uh, know, uh, Hong Kong and Singapore. Finally, the things that we're, in, in, uh, we're gonna increasingly see as, as having identity are devices. Now this doesn't happen so much at the moment because IoT is still in its infancy, um, but in a few years, probably not that many years, um, devices will be, you know, the thing that have the most identity in the world, right? So doorknobs and toasters and washing machines and all that sort of stuff. Um, they'll all sort of have their, have, have a way to identify themselves and authenticate themselves with everything else in the world. And furthermore, they'll have ways to um, have asset ownership and data attached to them. And that's where the interesting stuff comes along, right? So assets and ownership. Basically, you break this down to two things: uh, real things and virtual things. Right? They're from fungible. Examples of real fungibles are like, you know, commodities like gold. Like this is where we actually attach, um, use the blockchain to attach ownership of a real-world asset um, on the uh, to the to a particular sort of token on the chain, and then whoever actually controls the token, in principle at least, um, uh, owns the asset. Um, and people are already doing this, right? So the guys in uh, digit guys in Singapore are already sort of experimenting with um, with gold ownership, and, and you can actually turn up with a virtual token and claim your you know bar of gold with principal um, And then you got virtual fungible. So this is you know this is actually cash. Cash is virtual, right? Most of it exists on a computer somewhere. So um, and then you've also got things like shares. So shares are essentially virtual as well. Um, and what we can do is store this stuff purely on, on chain. So it exists only as an on chain asset, but it has, in some sense, a real world meaning. Some of them may have a real world meaning, some of them may not. In any case, they're both, um, uh, they're both virtual assets. And then the final thing is like 
data and information. So some data might be attributed to other um, instances or classes on the system. Um, one can imagine a, a attributing data to an, an individual or a data to an asset class. Um, other data might be just be global. And we can imagine data that's global could be things like um, weather reports, um, <coughs> random information streams, um, uh, real-world currency uh, valuations, and so on. Uh, data could be like freeform or formatted. So freeform data, just like you know, natural language, or um, a random information stream might be quite freeform as well. Or it could be formatted. So it, it's you know we can imagine all sorts of formats for this, where you can actually uh, machine read it and in some sense uh, make some structure from it. Um, in any case, it what data is 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 there for is to add external relevance to internal concepts. So what this, what this does is it, it, is it, it makes the stuff that we would normally have in the system. So it's, in the system it's isolated, right? It's really lonely in Ethereum. All you've got to play with is the other stuff that's in Ethereum. You can't go out to the outside world. You have to have the outside world come into you. And that's where the data comes in, right? So the data is just saying, right, this stuff about the, there is information about the outside world that you don't yet know, but I'm gonna tell you about, and here it is. Um, now this can be stuff like um, well, it's stuff like I, I mentioned. So it's stuff like um, what's the price of gold today in terms of the U.S. dollar? Um, what that storm that was in uh, Japan? What, you know, how's it going now? Um, how much damage did it cause? And so on. Those are the pillars, but. What, what we want to do is take these basic ingredients, these primary colors, and mix them and create paintings. And these are some of the paintings that we can create. So if we mix data and assets, then we've got a bunch of use cases that we can suddenly, suddenly open up. Insurance and gaming. I mean, insurance and gaming are basically the same thing, right? <laughs> Um, in insurance, data is arbitrary real-world information, uh, and assets are dispersed on the outcome. In gaming, data is arbitrary random information, assets are dispersed on the outcome. Mm -hmm. Pegged currency. So a pegged currency is basically uh, a means of um, uh, applying real-world information to an on-chain asset. Um, if there's time, I will show you uh, an example of something which can form a pegged currency uh, on chain um, after this. Um, essentially, uh, a pegged currency works by um, allowing um, a counterparty to bet against an, on on a, a, an information stream, and by doing so, with an asset, and by doing so, they create a derived, a derived asset that's on chain that mimics. The, the data stream that, 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 that's coming. Asset classification is also um, it's more, it's a more subtle one, but it's basically where we ascribe um, information to assets in order to do other stuff to them later. So we can imagine that um, we, we wish to apply formatted, semi-structured information in order to be able to distinguish between different asset classes. It, in and of itself, it's not especially useful, but it becomes very useful when we uh, move on to other things like marketplaces. We combine data and identity, then we get a bunch more things. So oracles are essentially taking um, uh, taking identity and then claiming information, global information generally. Um, on the basis of their identity. So it's sort of, I am weather.com, and I claim it's raining in Paraguay right now. Okay. Now, it's up to you to whether you trust weather.com to tell you whether it's raining in Paraguay, but assuming that you do, then you now have some useful information about the weather in Paraguay. <coughs> so that's where you've got global information that an identity is vouching for. Now, reputation is where um, an identity claims not global information, 
put identity specific information on another identity. So now you've got a sort of many to many mapping of, of this identity, whereas before it's just one to, uh, many to one. Finally, you've got things that badges. Now, badges don't really fit particularly easily into any of these categories, but I, I put it in here. It's sort of like um, an asymmetric right, description of, of, of data. Let's assume it's non-scalar. So reputation is kind of scalar. You know, someone can be of, of very good repute or of very bad repute, but it's not really multidimensional. I mean, you can argue it might be multidimensional, but at least uh, it, it fits into a linear one well enough. eBay's reputation system is linear. Um, so uh, badges are, are non-scalar. They tend to be uh, qualitative rather than quantitative. Um, and the sorts of information we can we can imagine being ascribed are things like attendance, um, maybe donations, um, maybe purchases. So, I mean, badges are this kind of unexplored frontier. I think we're going to see an awful lot of them popping up in the future, especially once we have on-chain identity systems that we can actually ascribe this information to. Um, but the sorts of things I reckon we're going to see in terms of badges are, I attended the first ever Pink Floyd concert, and I got a badge to prove it. And that's like, that badge could then be worth an awful lot, right? If you, 50 years on, go, yeah, I was at the first ever Pink Floyd concert, it's like, prove it. Oh, I got a badge, oh. Yeah. I mean, this stuff goes for, for huge amounts of money on eBay now, right? Stuff from, from, uh, from the early days of what turned out to be the next big thing. Um, donations, I think, are actually going to be a really good thing for the world. So if, if at the moment when you donate to a charity, it's like, you know, no one really knows you donated. So you don't get any like, kudos. You get a nice warm feeling in your head. But, you know, bragging rights are, are always worth something. So um, if, if, you know, when you write your, like, your Twitter, you know, you write your tweets, or you're on social media, or you're writing emails, if next to your name it came up with an impossible to, um, um, uh, to refute, impossible to, um, uh, uh, to forge um, uh, token, that stated you did actually give X amount to charity <coughs> on that year of this particular charity. You know, it's it's something that you uh, uh, that might feel, make you feel, make, might make you more likely to actually give to charity in the future. And purchases as well. I mean, back in the old days, you know, we used to have CDs. Yeah. What a quaint notion! Like <laughs> using physical media to store information. Um, and we would we would stack our CDs up, and people would come to our, our houses or our, our rooms if we were students and look at the CDs. And, Oh, you, you like them, do you? Um, why? Because it's it's. Um, why did we show them off? Well, because we like to show off who we are. We like to we like to demonstrate who we are. And why CDs? Why the, why this physical media? Because it's actually a strong economic signal. We paid money for it. Yeah, it takes up space there. So it's it's a strong economic signal about our personality. And um, and yeah, uh, badges that can that can ascribe this stuff can do exactly the same strong economic signal, but can do so in a virtual environment an environment in which we live most of our lives these days. Now, if we combine assets and identity, then we end up with, uh, with another bunch of interesting stuff. So, certification, which is kind of like badges, except for things, right? So this is where um, identity, rather than uh, being based around some just data, it says, right, um, I, as the, uh, I, as the uh, Forestry Commission, um, as ascribe my identity to this wood, right? And it means that that wood, that, that asset, um, has my um, reputation, my identity, uh, imbued on it. Then we've got asset tracking, which is turning it on its side, right? And it's, now we're talking about um, tracking previous ownership relations of assets. So I own this stuff now, sure, but who owned it? before, and who owned it before then, and before then. And we can go all the way back into what we would probably call a supply chain. But in principle, it can happen um, after the initial purchase. So it can happen in, you know, for second-hand goods. And we can imagine you know, the logbook of cars could become um, a useful sort of uh, example of why we'd use this. And then um, this kind of whole thing, which is a whole other world, uh, really. Um, Judge Desker and Broadway Identity. So this is where we're actually taking, um, using a private service in order to um, escrow virtual assets, right? So, and in principle, the assets can, can move into the real world when we, when, we, uh, when we use this as well. Bonded identity works alongside this. So bonded identity is where I take my identity and I, in order to give it strong economic meaning, I attach cash to it. 
and I attach cash that's claimable by anyone else, in principle at least. How do they claim it? Well, they have to demonstrate that there was wrongdoing, and they have to take it to someone that, that presumably I trusted that you know, is, is, is going to be um, fair. Uh, but in principle, what this allows us is something that, that, that we have in civil law by default. Um, in civil law, a court can actually say, you know, right, you have to pay up this amount of damages. Well, it can't really do that in crypto law because there's, there's no way of, of sending the police around if they don't pay. But what we can do is say, well, if you want to take part in this service, you have to be bonded. Yeah? And you have to be bonded with, uh, with a bond attached to a, uh, a bailiff or a judge that we, uh, that we respect. And if you do so, then you can actually play with us. And this is something that, that could get around an awful lot of, um, a lot of issues that, that come up in, in crypto law, particularly in the denial of service attacks. Now, if we combine all of those, then we get a bunch of uh, even more interesting sort of uh, 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 more useful stuff. So, when we combine, uh, we can derive directly from a reputation system um, something more like a credit rating system, where we have uh, actual um, sort of nodes of super repute, identities of super repute, where we actually say, right, we're going to just trust these guys because they seem to know what they're doing. Um, now, if we uh, in, uh, introduce oracles um, into the mix, so data feeds, with reputation, then we can have semi-trust-free, semi I mean, it kind of trust-free, not really, um, uh, oracles. But what, what it means is that we don't, we don't have to trust sort of a single um, um, uh, sort of uh, imbued establishment to tell us what the information is. We can trust each other because we have a reputation system to, to detect which of us are playing by the, by the rules and which of us are not. Um, and this, this obviously is a somewhat more fault tolerant system because it's much more plural. And then if we combine um, uh, pegged currency, um, which sort of went off uh, before, with assets, so a, uh, a currency that's actually sort of derived from real world information uh, with assets, then we can imagine um, virtual retail where assets that can be ascribed, the ownership of which can be ascribed directly on the chain, we can actually have completely trust free trade. So where we don't have to trust the other guy at all, um, we can go see in a contract that if we pay them, the asset will come to us. Now we can already imagine this for things like in-game assets, where you know it, it's purely based, the, the ownership of which is very clearly based in an IT system. But we, yeah, we can we can see that that can there's no sort of human ability to to prevent that trade from from a valid trade from going going through. Um, but it's a lot harder to imagine that for um, for real world stuff. But uh, anyone who's sort of been um, uh, Airbnb, Airbnb around Japan will, um, uh, will probably understand what the future looks like, in t at least in terms of things like um, services. Um, an awful lot of stuff is automated in Japan, right? Like way more than, uh, than at least in the UK. Um, and Airbnb is one of the things that, that's, that's actually getting towards near full level of automation. So you know the door lock is, is automated and the cleaning service can be made automatic and, and it, it, it all feels very, um, uh, very like there's no uh, large degree of human intervention. Now if the door lock becomes uh, you know, a sort of uh, slock it or airlock uh, controlled door lock, then we can actually imagine a purely chain based um, service. And when you know, cleaning services move onto the blockchain as well, then we can automate the entire thing in a contract. And in principle, at least, the house can own itself and start uh, renting itself out and paying its own mortgage, uh, which is a, <coughs> an interesting proposition. Now, if we uh, introduce um, reputation and escrow to the virtual retail, then we can imagine a real marketplace, which is basically just the same as eBay, right? Um, Uh, a simple truth engine could be given a, just as data or reputation, reputation. So this is where we have a question. And the types of questions that are answered by these things, rather than by something much more complex like a prediction uh, market, um, are things for which there's a very clear answer. Like, you know, did it rain in Paraguay? Uh, maybe that's not clear enough. Um, is the sky blue? Um, 
what's important is there can't be too much uncertainty about the answer. You don't want people arguing. So it's important that anyone of a high repute will give the same correct answer. And thus the shelling point is, um, uh, is, very, uh, is very strong. Um, of course, you know, prediction engines can, uh, uh, prediction markets can, uh, can answer the statements that we're less sure about, including things like future statements. The statements of them. Um, finally, when you take a truth engine and you combine it with a bonded identity, and you can imagine a court, a sort of court of the internet. And this is where you end up with the, a, 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 the process of a court being um, formalized as a computer program. The inputs to the court being things like the truth engine, and this would potentially, a, a, you know, a complex truth engine could allow stuff like um, uh, expert testimony. So it's like, we can imagine a truth engine that, that maybe is a little bigger than this, whereas there's a period of time where the people of high repute can have experts, maybe with their own high reputation ratings, given to them in order to answer questions pertaining to the final statement of, did he do it or not? And uh, if he did, then the bonded identity would allow the bailiff to take uh, some amount of damages from, from them and, and, and give it to the defendant. Um, now that's a bit in the future yet because we have to build all this stuff first, but at least in principle it could work. And yet more stuff. So if we move into trade, then we can combine a truth engine with some escrow and we end up with a trade mediator, which is just you know, someone that, that checks what the forces a, 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 a trade. So it's like a court except um, there's less, um, you don't have to have bonded identity because the the, the potential damages that you're going to award are a, a part of the escrow anyway. Now, then you can move on from trade mediator into, into trade finance, where now we're suddenly automating trade mediation, and we're basing um, who's allowed to use it on the credit rating. We're using real-world currency um, to actually store the value, and then we're tracking the asset ownership in order to transfer the value um, when, the, uh, when the ownership uh, changes got that, then in principle you have the beginnings of a trade finance system. And it's completely decentralized. And then we can take certification and, uh, and combine it with asset tracking um, in order to work out what our supply chain actually is. So we can do things like um, know uh, not only who owned the stuff that we're now buying, but um, what attributes are ascribed to them. So we can work out maybe if it's made, we might know that it was a particular factory that made this stuff, but we might not know what the working conditions were like in the factory. Well, this will allow us to have um, certifications on factories that are then trackable to the stuff that they've actually made. And we can apply that to, at least in principle, any complexity of, of the supply chain. So then we can know who has certified the certifiers, who has been round from the certifiers to check the factory when they, were, when they went round there. Um, maybe their comments on certification and all, the rest of it. And, uh, and all of this information, at least in principle, can be placed uh, uh, on the chain and can be accessible by anyone who ends up owning the final. There are my thoughts on where we are. Uh, any questions? You, you mentioned mostly trust-free or I'm wondering is the removal of that word mostly theoretically possible or is it not theoretically? Uh, that is a and, quite and, and deep I mean, economic and, question. And is, is a paid currency an oracle? Is a paid currency an oracle? An oracle. Um, paid currency, oh well, paid currencies, there are a few <coughs> ways of, um, of implementing them. In general, so the ones that I find most um, practical require an oracle, um, but uh, there are ways of doing peg currencies that don't require an oracle. Now whether there are any ways of doing a peg currency that don't require any sort of trust at all uh, is a different question. Um, so one way of doing a peg currency is to be a central bank, and you own a whole load of currency and then you issue tokens. And that's 
more or less what, what the guys in Singapore are doing with the gold. Um, now, in principle, if you had, um, there are stable coin um, uh, sort of, um, I think there's actually one that's been implemented, uh, it's in alpha, but there are uh, stable coin at least um, uh, uh, theorized uh, systems. Um, but I don't think they operate without. Does anyone, uh, can anyone maybe uh, uh, inform better than I can here? Anyone know the de technical de details of stable coins? No. <laughs> um, I don't think they operate without a, um, uh, without an oracle, but I might be wrong. So that's worth looking into. Uh, but the most obvious one, at least from my, my point of view, is a contract for difference based uh, stable coin which is where you have a derivative contract where uh, uh, one of the counterparties, their assets are denominated essentially in, or their portion of their, um, their um, uh, uh, loan, which is effectively what they're making, they're a creditor, is, de is um, denominated in a particular real world asset. And then in principle, that loan can then be um, broken up into little chunks and passed around, those chunks can be passed around as, as tokens. Now, a CFD does require um, uh, an information feed as to what the uh, price of that, that uh, real-world asset is in comparison to um, the virtual asset that's the, the actual underlying value. But um, I would say then mostly trust-free is probably going to be trust-free enough for most of this stuff to run. And the nice thing is it's, it's kind of a sliding scale. So although you may never get to the sort of you know holy grail of no need to trust anybody ever. You know, in reality, most practical systems, you do need to trust some people, but the, the important thing is to trust um, as many people as possible, a little bit, as, uh, as little as possible. Um, and then it's very unlikely that any particular entity in the world that, that you know, unfairly wants to do you, uh, do, do you wrong um, uh, will be able to, to manage it. Um, but it's a, it is an interesting economic question as to whether we can ever um, get a system that is, um, in some sense, uh, completely trust free. Um, uh, it's a shame Vlad isn't here because uh, if, he, if he was, he could probably go on about this for quite a long time. What kind of timeline are you looking at for, for these to come to fruition? Um, well, I can show you a demo of a CFD now that's on chain. Um, so I reckon uh, not that long. I mean, it really just depends on, on how many people come along and, and what they, you know, if they want to hack on this stuff. If, if people come along and hack on it, then it won't take long at all. In principle, all this stuff, the, the critical problems are solved, and it's mostly just about you know making it usable. So coding it up, um, uh, making sure that it's actually performant enough, um, coming to the right <coughs> standards so that they can all actually interoperate with each other, and then and then making it usable so that people actually want to use it. A lot of this stuff is, is going to be a lot. It's going to be mostly dependent on on uh, being used. So, for example, things that are, that, that der uh, derive their value from there being a liquid market. Well, you need enough participants in the market before it's going to become useful. Um, and in some sense, one follows from the other. You, you build it, and, and they're going to come, or you wait for them to come, and then you build it. No, I just build it. It's fun. It's fun to build. It. So oracles are basically bonding license and oracle, right? So, so what, what part of your thing you're breaking up now? So oracles don't have to be any of those things. Oracles are simply ways, are simply injections of, of outside information that may or may not be true into the system. So that's why they kind of call oracles. It's like information from heaven. But today's escrow systems are those three things, right? So if you call oracles escrow systems, you need to support those three paradigms. Um, so escrow systems. Yeah. Um, Generally, uh, and more about um, the uh, uh, the temporary holding of an asset based upon some information. Now that information could come from an oracle. Um, so the the two kind of work together in principle. And then um, the where oracles kind of can become trust free is where you can attach um, other information <coughs> to particular identities in order to identify which one of, which, which of them are most trustworthy. And then in principle, you could, uh, for example, take the, the median. So you basically take all of the oracles, line them up in order of, um, in order of trust, 
and then use uh, some cutting statistics in order to work out where in that lineup um, uh, the one that you want to trust the most is, given how similar each of their answers are. So basically, how what the distribution is. <laughs> Um, in terms of Metropolis, what, what, what do you reckon is the timeline there? Ooh, yes. Uh, opinions differ. <laughs> um, I, I, I would like to see uh, a reasonably regular hard fork, just to get people, um, you know, miners and, and, and so on, into the habit of upgrading. Um, I... It, it, I can't really say when it's going to happen, but I would say that uh, if you look at past uh, past experience, the original upgrade to Homestead was planned, I think, around November uh, last year, and it ended up happening in February, so three months later. So I would say it's going to be, once we have um, these changes implemented, it will probably be about three months after that. Maybe two, if we're really good, two. So, assuming it takes maybe a month to implement these changes, then maybe in three months' time. So we don't want next Feb, or we don't want August. Uh, three months' time. So we're in April now. So May, June, July, maybe July. Who knows? For for the homestead changes. But the thing about homestead is it's probably going to be dependent on um, on the availability of mist more than a, these 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 changes. So what's the situation with Sorry, not Homestead. Sorry. What's the situation with East Street, though? Uh, it's, oh, you can download it. Yeah. Uh, I mean, it's in no, it's not just the wallet. Uh, yeah. But in principle, it contains all of the. So the wallet is just an application that happens to run in the browser, and it's kind of locked there. But um, it's nonetheless a sort of quite fully featured application. So swapping it out for any other applications is, uh, is, is <coughs> not big issue really you know, in, the, in the scheme of things the bigger problem is going to be you know actually how does that um, how does swapping between applications work what about uh, sort of background information feeds when you want to see what's going on in the application without going to it uh, URL bars how does that work integration of uh, additional services like the name rigid for structure and all the rest of it so that might take a little longer but at least in principle the hard work you're playing the end of the summer um, I would have to defer to Fabian for when uh, <laughs> when he feels it's going to be. But uh, I think uh, I think this year is a reasonable estimate. Can you talk a little bit about uh, how you feel around ultimate scalability? Because we don't have to go deep into sharding, but I'm curious, taking Bitcoin as sort of a lesson here. Uh, a lot of activity going off chain with it because it's not able to scale. Yep. And I know you guys have a lot of plans for scaling it, but given a lot of the use cases, what do you see ultimately being on chain with Ether and then potentially off chain and coming back to Ether? Uh, I'd hope to avoid off chain as much as possible, um, mostly because it feels like it's a band aid. Um, you know, when I when I did the initial work for Solidity and you know thought about stuff like the NAND spin, I really wanted to make a system where the only you only need to think about two things. You need to think about your front end, so the DAP stuff, and you need to think about what's on chain. And you don't need to think about you know additional infrastructure that you might need to use if it turns out that you want to use the chain too much. Um, so for me, it's all about making it as developable as, poss poss as possible. Um, and that means that uh, the system should scale without you having to think too deeply about you know, what bits of infrastructure to pick and choose in order for, to make your application work at scale. Um, my, uh, I think, so we have pretty good ideas about how to make the thing scale. Um, the thing that I mentioned earlier with the, 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 the transaction parallelism is definitely the first, the first step. Transactions are going to be labeled as being um, able to be executed in isolation of, in a particular shard. Um, now, the big hurdle to get to after that is splitting up the state and having different nodes store bit, different bits of the state. And then the biggest hurdle is what happens when a transaction happens across multiple states? Who processes it? Um, the simplest answer to that, so there are a couple of, of, of ways of thinking and the, 
the final answer is probably going to be um, uh, only uh, determined after each of the ways of each of the suggested ways of doing it have been implemented and tested. Um, one of them is just to have asynchronous transactions. So basically, your transaction executes in one particular shard, and then when it needs to interact with some other shard, it stops. A transaction is sort of formed, a, a, as well as a, a receipt as to where it sort of stopped, and then <coughs> it's asynchronously sent off to some other shard, some other node, and the node gets that, executes its part, and then sends it back again when it's done. Um, the alternative is to say, right, nodes actually have to get together. So if you've got a node processing shard A and a node processing shard B, and you've got a transaction that happens to need A and B, then the two nodes collaborate and they offer Merkle proofs of each of this prior state, and then one of them, maybe both, process given that information, and then end up with the post state, and they both uh, reciprocate that post state on their chain. And they both provide proofs about what <coughs> happened in the transaction, so free the inputs and the outputs, um, on each of their chains so that um, anyone who's only processing A or only processing B can actually process the transaction in full. Um, yeah, we'll have to see about which one works the best. Um, but I reckon it's closer than, than, than people think. I think we've got enough of, a, enough of an idea about how it's going to work that we'll be able to see um, initial prototypes of these systems in place early next year. Great, thank you. Is there a white paper on this or do you just talk? Uh, there's, there's a bunch of, like, I don't know if there's a very particular white paper, there's certainly a bunch, of, I wrote a bunch of information on, on the latter idea. I think uh, probably there are people writing information on the first idea. Um, <laughs> so you have some way of giving the gas to different people as different shards? All that stuff is in um, Vitalik and I had a long conversation about this uh, about 12 months ago, and yeah, it, in principle, it's big enough. Uh, it just needs to be perfect. Um, if a program can write a contract, then it So every block has a fixed amount of resources that they can consume on the on all of the nodes of the network that want to process the block. Um, that resource um, is a metric that takes into account uh, computation, memory usage, and also storage. Um, when you ex when you write a contract, you you use the storage, and therefore you actually use up um, use up this resource. And at the moment, this resource is called gas. It's measured in in uh, this unit, this odd unit called gas, um, and I think it's around four million, four point seven. Yeah. Um, so you would up that to ten million, right? So yeah. You would up that to ten million, right? Uh, yeah. Across, I mean, across. in in principle, it's um, it's something that miners can change. So it's not that we up it. I mean, we can change defaults, um, but <coughs> at the end of the day, miners can alter those defaults. I mean, it's just a command line option, right? No, but if it goes from one place to another place to another place and comes back, right? Mm. Then, then we have a. Then oh, you mean for, for, for a scalable yeah, exactly. Well, I mean, yeah, yeah. there are a whole bunch of, uh, of questions that need to be explored. Okay. In a, a contract where to subscribe to multiple transactions of different schemas, how would that work in practice? If, if a contract has to subscribe to multiple transactions which have different schemas, let's say one is a payment transaction, the other one is. Okay. How would that work? Um, so the contract would exist in a single shard. I mean, it actually doesn't have to, but let's assume yeah, a simpler circumstance where the contract exists in a single shard. Then all transactions would be processed in that shard. So regardless of what the, what the transaction was trying to do, uh, that wouldn't matter because it's actually just execution of code, <coughs> and the code, um, the inputs of the code, or at least the state of the contract that those inputs would, would be altering uh, are contained. But how do you create the blocks? Would the, would the miner have to create separate blocks for each type of transaction? Um, no. no. They, as far as the miner is concerned, the transactions are homogenous. How are you 
Ah, uh, so you mean specifically for Ethereum? Yeah, uh, that's, a, that's an interesting question. What we definitely don't want to do is follow the great example that Bitcoin has set. Um, I would like to see a DAO of critical stakeholders um, make these decisions, but governance is an incredibly thorny issue. Um, at the moment, it just about works having the core developers make the decisions, but I think when uh, in the fullness of time, um, we're going to need to see something a little more um, substantial, especially if um, uh, sort of benevolent dictators take a back seat. So, I mean, Linux works fine, right? Because Linus DeVault is the guy that made it, and he makes the decisions on it. And he's actually a good decision maker. Um, now, if you take something much more distributed and decentralized, it's not clear how uh, the, the stakeholders can um, get along and form a single voice. Um, I, a DAO seems to be the obvious solution, just because, hey, we're decentralized and DAOs work on Ethereum, and why not, let's try it. But um, even still, the logic behind the DAO is, is still logic about human interactions, and that can be, um, that can be gained, and that can be, become political, and all the rest of it. So I don't really know, um, know what. I do think that um, having um, a single set of stakeholders behind the protocol um, that are in some sense aligned um, is probably not a good plan. Uh, so I think a, a very sort of disaligned multi-stakeholder approach is, 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 uh, is a sensible way forward. Um, I mean, there's all sorts of theories about why Bitcoin is, um, is in the state that it's in. Uh, and some of those um, have things to do with kind of uh, whales in the Bitcoin ecosystem uh, exercising their weight according to their own um, strategies and needs. Um, and it will be a shame to see the same thing happen. So how do you prevent this? Well, um, having a more algorithmic manner uh, is one way. Uh, keeping a, bene a benevolent dictator is another way. Um, but there are no easy answers because at the end of the day, you know, it's humans are involved and human governance. We've been working on that for an awful long time and we still have those. <laughs> <laughs> um, any other questions? Uh, what's the timeline? Uh, Serenity. Um, Vitalik's better, better, better um, sort of position to answer that. Um, I mean, there are uh, proofs of concept. Um, there are um, uh, good ideas. I think it's one of these things that's going to be 90% of the way there for quite a long time, and then finally they'll sort it. Um, and they're definitely 90% of the way there, but they, they have been. Um, there are uh, edge cases that keep coming up and that need to be addressed, and, uh, and then of course you address them, it becomes more complex, you need to simplify it down, you can do so, and then there's more educators. Um, so it's going to be an iterative approach, but um, at least in principle, um, it's so in theory, it has to be there by February, because February is when the, uh, the time bomb kicks in and <laughs> mining stops being uh, possible. <laughs> so, <laughs> um, probably, I, mean, I, 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 I don't know, but uh, if it isn't February, then there's going to be a hard fork, which makes mining viable for a bit longer. Um, one possibility is that there will be um, an additional release inserted before Serenity, that brings either um, a simplified proof of stake or a hybrid proof of stake proof of work, um, and that might make some sense in order to, you know, sort of have a good answer for why the time bomb is being uh, removed and also um, uh, to push things forward in terms of protocol. Um, personally, I think it would be quite a sensible idea to have a, a simple proof of stake before um, uh, before Casper. Uh, can I go back to a technical question on the uh, account creation, um, not using uh, the nonce anymore? Um, does that also apply if I create contract instances from within another contract, a factory contract, using a constructor? Yeah, can I, does that mean I cannot create multiple instances of a, of a contract anymore? Uh, not only, only contract deployment 
uh, so the easy way of doing that with the toolset. So in the future, the toolset will manage that, I'm sure. But right now, um, the way that you would do it is have an additional constant in the contract. So just like have a uint constant in the contract, and then initialize that from the constructor with a different value every time you make a new contract. And then the code will become different, and the problem will be solved. Scholastic education. Uh, could you, uh, could you uh, maybe go a little? Just uh, sort of general education, like uh, high school. No, we need we need our Raspberry Pi Foundation uh, to really uh, push that angle. I think um, the great thing about uh, writing Ethereum is that it's it's um, it's almost like a primer, quite an in-depth primer in pretty much everything you learn in, in a computer science uh, degree, right? So you have to write your own compiler, and you have to write your own virtual machine, and you have to write your own network code, and you have to write your own this and that. It, it, it's, really, it's really good. Um, I think it would be uh, really nice if um, some aspects of maybe like hardware design and, and um, execution environment stuff and intermediate language stuff were actually uh, uh, taught just by using like, Ethereum, the EVM. So, you know, we you know, back in when I was at, at, at university, one of the things that we did was like programming Z80s to, to <coughs> do stuff with uh, uh, oscilloscopes. I mean, it, it's kind of similar stuff when you're writing EVM code. So, uh, but no, I haven't seen much much use in the wild. Yet. Uh, it's still early days, right? You talk about um, the contracts. I think you said were immortal and immutable, mm -hmm. which is great. But I'm just—I don't understand how it would fix something wrong with the contract if it was immutable. Ah, uh, yeah. I move the contract forward. Yeah, that's a hard one. That's a hard one. So um, the way it would work is you would. So we've got this great thing called call code. And what it does is it calls another contract's code. And the contract code that it calls is a programmable address, which means you'd have to call the same contract every time. So the way that you would, if you want to do this, and one of the ways that you, one of the reasons you don't want to do this is because you want to be able to prove to your users that this code will always work forever, and it's been audited, and it's absolutely certain that it's secure. But assuming that you do want to have a much more flexible system where the code can change, then you would firstly have a set of signatories, or at least some process for changing it and this process would have to be so good that your users don't mind the, the chance of the code changing to something that, would, that, would, that is bad. So I'm not sure, of course these systems will exist because they already do exist. Bank, banks can change their back end without telling their customers and their customers don't care. Um, but um, given that, the way that you would implement it is you would, the, when the contract comes in, the first thing it does is it just gets an address out of its storage and does a call code on that address. And then the contract, whatever code is at that address would run with the first contract storage. Yeah? And then you wouldn't need to, the data wouldn't have to be migrated if you wanted to change what code actually ran. And then there'd be some other bit of, a bit of um, code um, in the first contract, in the master contract, that would allow the state, the, the sort of I don't know, guardians or stewards or whatever, to change the code if they so decided. But personally, I prefer getting it right the first thing. I, I don't know how to do that. Uh, there's a lot of fiber on uh, blockchain. I see a couple of years before we have some kind of fiber on block big data, right? So when do you think will, this will become an enterprise ready kind of one? Sorry, so when do you think that this will become enterprise ready? We hear a lot of use cases. Um, beyond that, uh, you know, when we need to take this into an enterprise, uh, someone talked about governance and stuff like that. So, you know, the regulators are stepping in. Uh -huh. When do you think that? Uh, so, in terms of. Um, yeah, so okay, there's there's a bunch of issues with enterprise usage. So the first is, um, when is the Ethereum ecosystem, when is the, the Ethereum, the value on the Ethereum chain, and the security that's protecting that value going to be sufficient enough to actually attract large scale usage? It's what, it's nearly a billion dollars? We're floating around a billion dollars at the moment. Yeah. Um, how much does it cost to uh, do a 51% attack 
for a 24 hour period. So if you leave it 24 hours, how much does it cost to rebuy the chain? If it's less than, I don't know, a million dollars or whatever, then realistically, you're not gonna be able to do much uh, big time supply trade trade, uh, trade finance on the, uh, on the chain. Um, I don't know the answer to that, but it's trivial to work out. That's one question. Now there's a couple of other questions. First is scalability, you know. Um, enterprise usage might see substantial amounts of transaction volume. Can the chain handle that, that level of transaction volume? Now actually, we're, we're doing pretty good in terms of transaction volume. Recently there's, so you sometimes get clumps of um, like two or 300 transactions per block yeah. for a bunch of blocks. Yeah, I mean this is, I think this is where exchanges kind of amalgamate all their accounts and yeah. put it all together. Um, so um, these happen uh, over a period. So normally you get about 250 block, uh, transactions per block. Blocks happen every 15 seconds. So we're getting like 15 or 20 transactions a second. Uh, that's pretty good. You know, I mean, yeah, if you can keep that up, then that's pretty good. Um, but it's still far cry off the sorts of uh, transaction volume that's needed for a, a wide scale payment system. And that's gonna be improved, like I said, maybe five to 10 X when we get transaction parallelism in. Um, which is getting getting better, but still not still not great, um, and uh, it's going to be through major scalability alterations to the protocol. It's actually going to deliver that final enough that's going to allow it to, to, to perform in those sorts of um, circumstances. Um, the final thing that's going to be um, kind of is a is a is a, a point for uh, for enterprise grade stuff is uh, privacy and confidentiality. Um, now, when this gets solved and the rest of it, then suddenly it's like, oh wow, this is this is the next, this is it, right? This is the, the singularity. Um, and this is where um, we have, I mean, the, the general case, the holy grail for confidentiality and privacy is to have um, known algorithm, but encrypted data in a tool. If we get that, then we're sorted. Now, in principle, things like CK Snarks can deliver this, the problem is that it's really, really highly computationally intensive to do, to actually create proofs for zk stacks. Um, it's still quite computationally intensive to, to verify them, but it's very uh, to create them. I think the last so there's a there's a bunch of uh, there's a team. Any any people from uh, uh, Z Zcash? Zero coin. They come on Friday. Just seeing you. So I was chatting to Zuko from that project. Uh, apparently, it's about two seconds at the moment to, per transaction to, to generate the, the proof, um, which is quite a lot. Yeah. You, know? you need, you need um, four gigabytes of RAM. Nice. <laughs> <laughs> so, I have an answer to that question. We have the same problem. We use a name registration, get the DAP on top of the name registration, and when you deploy the contract, you get the data, it gets from the back of the gas, gets from the old contract, and put the data in the new contract. And then publish a new address on the new contract. Uh, okay, so that's that, that's one way of doing the yeah the, the moving the code over. But um, the issue with that is that every time you do it, you need to replicate the data, and inserting that amount of data into a contract may be non-trivial. It might be structured data, and also it may be um, it may be an awful lot of data, and it thus may be costly or actually impossible to do within a simple block. You may end up with a contract and then determine the state for that period. But anyway, the original contract literally gets bigger and bigger because of the data, right? Mm -hmm. So it anyway will get shorted, right? So it's... Oh, I see. Right, yeah, just, okay. Uh, what's, what's their scalability? Yeah, yeah. 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 it's very good. Uh, that's true, that's true. So, um, yeah, for confidentiality, there's a bunch of stuff. One of the things that we're probably going to bring in um, sooner rather than later um, is uh, uh, ring signatures. So this allows what I've called homogenous um, privacy or homogenous confidentiality. This is where you have a bunch of identities. They all want to do roughly the same thing. The only thing that they want to do differently is who they do it to. Right? So the action is the same, but the object is different. Um, example, voting. Right? So I, maybe there's, there's five of us, we all want to vote, but it's just we, we, we want to vote for different things. And what we want to do is, um, is permute those actions while having the final, um, the final uh, outcome be the same. So the final outcome, you know, uh, how many votes does uh, candidate one, two, three, four, or five have? Um, but we don't want to let it be known who has voted for who, so we're just gonna uh, 
permutation on that mapping. Um, that can be done. So there are cryptographic primitives that allow that to happen. And these can be integrated quite easily into the uh, into Ethereum just by having a pre-compiled, a predefined, pre or built-in contract <coughs> that does all of that heavy crypto and does it fast. And then other contracts can just use that. Um, there are also ways of doing it um, that are more for consortium chains, but could in principle be used on the public chain as well. Um, but these would require a trusted third party or um, a very restricted set of operations to be able to use things like multi-party multi computation. So, um, example here is where you've got a contract. Um, all the data is encrypted. The encrypted the encryption keys are held by a trusted authority, or a trusted third party, and you know, <coughs> yeah, I don't like that either. But you know, in some use cases, it's fine. Uh, all of the contract uh, data is encrypted, so the keys may be visible. Maybe the keys are also encrypted. Um, and the state root of the contract, the storage root of the contract, is signed. So every time anything is changed, yeah, the, the trusted third party decrypts all the keys, runs the algorithm, the runs the transaction on it, re-encrypts all the data, and then signs the new state root. And then anyone else who's checking the, 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 um, that the transaction has been executed correctly can just check that that, that new state root was indeed signed by the, the trusted third party that's, that's actually executing this stuff. Now in principle, you could have many different, uh, you could have the trusted third, third party not just be a single third party, but be a bunch of them and they have to actually agree on it. So you could have like an N of N um, uh, signature, uh, uh, multi-signature <laughs> on that. And that, that, that could be a, a, a reasonably good way of, of doing things. The issue is that they have to have full access to the information. And it may be that you don't want any one party to have full access to all the information. Um, now, if that's the case, then you can use some, some like multi-party computation stuff, where you still have third parties, but they operate on encrypted information. Now, the issue with encrypted information is that it's really hard to do general computation on it. But if the sort of computation you want to do is stuff like add and subtract, then there are actually cryptographic ways of cryptographic primitives that allow you to um, encrypt the information, allow the addition to happen by a trusted third party, who's maybe taking two streams of encrypted information and adding them together and then giving it back and then decrypting it. Um, and that, that can work. Um, and then it's just a case of uh, how rich a, a set of computation can we, can we bring to this uh, encrypted information. And then you're getting into like, yeah, like I say, multi-party computation and homomorphic encryption, which is still a bit like that. Any updates to when the pre pocket Um. About, I think, what was it, about two weeks? <laughs> um, soon. soon. Um, I don't know much more. Can you talk through how a 51% attack would go uh, with proof of stake ecosystem? Because it's a little more clear with proof of work. Um, but then if you've got people who are bonding um, their stake, like, would it be, would I have to buy 51% of all of the assets stored on Ethereum, or would I just have to co-opt the people that have bonded their assets? I'm just curious as like how this, the, the attack actually progresses. So um, the 51% attack, at least in my knowledge, is, is all about uh, proof of work. And it doesn't really map so easily onto proof of stake. So okay. typically in proof of stake, you, you have um, so how would you co-opt like. the network with proof of stake? Um, so there's a notion of a 30% attack. That's even worse, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. 30%. <laughs> um, and this is essentially where um, many of the Byzantine fault tolerant algorithms work as long as there isn't more than 30% of the participants that are, that are um, both aligned and malicious. Um, when they are, they can essentially prevent state transition. They can prevent anything from happening. Um, now, from what I know of Casper, and this is a little, this is a little out of date now, so uh, you know, maybe Vlad can correct me next time he speaks. Um, the um, the consensus can fork and merge later on. So in principle, um, seventy percent can move forward in consensus and let the thirty percent malicious people form their own fork and continue and then they just continue into 
oblivion. So you just keep on avoiding the attackers, basically. Okay. But um, yeah, I, uh, it's still a while out, and the uh, more simplistic by the default <coughs> tolerant algorithms uh, do have this. For, for proof of stake, the biggest problem was there's a nothing to take issue where you can you can basically try to attack the network even if only have one percent of the network, and the probability of you mining one or two or three blocks in succession is really really low. The cost for me to try to stake multiple blocks and run multiple parallel chains at the same time is basically nil, right? Because I'm not using like mining hash power, a lot of electricity, right? So basically the point is that you can run multiple parallel chains at the same time. It's a nothing at stake issue, right? And when I have a chain that happens to be longer than the rest of it, then I can do some malicious transaction in the shorter chain and then have it reorg to my chain later on by just broadcasting the chain that's ahead. So that's a nothing at stake issue. That's that's the issue that people don't really talk about, but that's one. Yeah, there's, um, so there are, there are a couple. So uh, one of them is indeed where you essentially rewrite the whole of history. Um, and it's this, this funny thing where uh, you, um, so this only works, this is the long, it's, it's also the long range attack, right? So it's long range because the attack begins at the sort of the very beginning of the chain where you've got very little resources. And the way proof of stake works is, um, as you uh, as you become more useful to the network, you gain more resources in order to, uh, to allow you to become more even more useful in the future. So if you go back to day one, step one, and you've got a little bit of resources, then you use those resources. And in your own version of the world, you don't let anyone else use theirs. And so it rewards you and you alone, and your resources go higher. And then you use those resources, yeah, and you don't let anyone else in your version of the world use theirs, and it goes even higher, and it snowballs. And even though the first few blocks might take weeks or months to mine in your version of the world, um, it doesn't matter because it's still nothing. It's that you, you're not actually uh, using any uh, real energy to mine it. You're just simulating uh, what would happen if you alone uh, uh, were, the, were the, uh, the sole block forger. But, but there are multiple implementations of proof of stake that people are testing that solve some of those issues. Because they don't use stake wave. They have like a, a lottery based system. There's a whole bunch of things. I, I think they're probably going to test all of them before they go to the Yeah, it's a bunch of a bunch of ways around this. So the other one is, um, uh, which Slash was originally meant to, meant to, meant to uh, work around, which is where you, um, uh, you sign for two forks. So the idea is that you can only sign for one fork, right? Because if there's a fork, you want the stakeholders to be the ones that form the consensus on which, form is, which fork is canonical. So that's, that's the whole point of consensus, is that you can't, is that the stakeholders go onto one or the other. So with mining, that's looked after by the fact that you have to expend a real physical resource. If you were to expend uh, your physical resource mining on two different forks, you'd have half of that resource for each one, because it's physical. Um, and so no one's going to do that. Why would you mine on two different forks? You'll mine on whichever fork you choose, and probably you're, probably you're betting there. And there'll be a, generally be a shelling point. Everyone will mine on one particular fork. And, the network will form a consensus that way. With staking, it doesn't cost you, at least in principle, anything to sign for both forks. So the way that that is fixed is by saying anyone who can prove that someone else signed on an alternative fork, they get um, slashed, they get punished on the fork on this fork. And that can work on both forks, and then it's not in anyone's interest to sign for. Yes, Panama. <laughs> <laughs> um, no, there's, there, I mean, you know, um, inevitably there are, um, there's dialogue, but uh, there's no, um, there's nothing substantial. We, uh, uh, foundation chats to uh, the people in its jurisdiction, so we inform them of what it's doing and make sure that they're happy. Uh, and that's uh, as you would expect. Uh, any
other than that. Regulators are kind of, um, I don't know, my, my reading of government is that they, uh, they don't mind as long as everyone's happy. When people start getting unhappy, maybe they're going to mind. That's an RPC that was there. So, how, so through IPC or RPC, how do I get a list of transactions for a given address? See, I'm an exchange. Yeah. Um, so, um, it depends which client you use. Some clients have, um, some clients don't have RPC. Some have a minimal RPC, and some have like more fully fledged RPC. Um, if you want to uh, inspect um, specific addresses, yes. um, what we call basic accounts, so not contracts. Um, it's hard. Um, it wasn't. It wasn't designed with that in mind. Now that said, it's something that will be introduced into parity. Right. So I'm going to change today, today, right? Yep. So we have accounts, users, trading points. How do we accept by one some third party or or writing some contracts, which costs money to do, which is kind of silly for an exchange to pay more money to do that? How do I go and inspect transactions on these basic accounts? What's the recommended? For waiting for the well, third-party explorers uh, in their back end do yeah. that. Yeah. Do precisely that, right? So, yeah, yeah. Um, so you basically roll your own explorer, essentially. And then, uh, if you don't want to use, so the thing is, using uh, contracts and logs is actually quite cheap. So transact. So it costs no more than a normal transaction. So uh, sending money to a contract and having the contract log that money has come from a particular address yeah. uh, is free. I mean, the, the gas was designed so that it so would be free. Okay. So it's only writing that initial contract itself but not actually viewing the... Yeah. It, it doesn't alter any state or anything like that. All right, it right. does is record that something has come to it. And then you can do uh, log uh, queries uh, on the RPC. So that, that's the recommended way. But yeah. Um, when is the parity stack now? Um, the 1.0 is a, well. The 1.0 is beta is out, but this feature will be introduced in 1.1 probably. So there's um, also the. Uh, uh, it's one month. There's also the Haskell client. I'm sorry. The, the Haskell API by uh, Blockout. It has a uh, REST API that you can query for uh, for transactions or specific accounts. Okay. All right. I'll try that. We're using Gavin. We're using Gavin's Gavin's yeah. 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 No, that's Jeff's. Don't let, don't let Jeff hear you say that. Oh, very yeah. <laughs> uh, any other questions? No. No. Can you comment on the R3's EV partnership? Uh, you mean other than the one that was announced on April 1st? <laughs> <laughs> So, uh, no. I'm pretty sure that doesn't exist. Uh, anyone else? Cool. Um, let me know if you've got any questions afterwards. Otherwise, thank you very much.